there we are. I think that will work. Right, let me just put this on to uh, onto the. Uh, Yeah, I'm just just get, getting on to the. Uh, there we are. Okay, is is that clear? Can you can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, um, this is the first time I've done something like this, so um, let's see how it goes. And. I say thank you very much, Nikhil, for the uh, invitation. Nikhil actually came up with the title, Warblers for, for Dummies. Um, I'm happy with that title, providing that it's understood that I'm not making any sort of reference to, um, to, to you all who are watching the talk. Um, the idea behind the talk is what Nikhil asked me was that it's uh, to give an introduction to warblers, uh, particularly for people who, um, when they see a warbler, may prefer to look in the opposite direction and get rather nervous about uh, the work required to, to identify them. Um, that's nothing to be worried about or ashamed of. I think all birders have favourite groups and also groups that they are less inspired by or they find more challenging. For many years, um, given the choice between looking at a warbler and an immature gull, I would have always have chosen the warbler. But I'm also getting now quite interested in immature gulls, uh, and so um, it's worth the effort. Um, so I'm pitching this talk as an introduction uh, for warbler identification. Uh, particularly in the North India region. Um, I, most of my birding in India um, was in the Delhi area. I suspect that there will be people with more experience of um, warblers and others in the group, and some with more experience of certain species than me, almost certainly. Um, so hopefully um, for those people, uh, it won't be uh, too, um, too elementary a talk, you'll still enjoy it. And as Nikhil said at the end, uh, if people wanted to, to, to chat any questions, put any questions on chat, we can um, try that if there is time. Otherwise, I'm more than happy to receive emails uh, if people want to continue the discussion over the next few days uh, or weeks, okay? Okay, so this is partly where it started um, by being a part of the Delhi Bird Group uh, from the year 2000 to 2004, when um, my wife and I spent uh, four of the happiest years of our, our lives uh, living in Delhi. Our son was born in Delhi and every weekend I would join a Delhi Bird uh, but, uh, birding group walk or if there wasn't one set up I would go out alone and uh, Okla was one of my local patches so uh, a very wonderful place to to see birds in general. I love being there in the summer watching the, the, the all of the different bitterns fly, flying past uh, but a superb area for warblers. And here we have a, a a Delhi, a Delhi bird group out in the field. Uh, this brings back very happy memories um, and I can't wait for the next opportunity of being, being back in Delhi to see some of you again. So this, this talk is really aimed at the people who would open the bird book on a page like this and then turn to the next page hoping there'll be something a little bit more inspiring. Um, so to, for many people, but, uh, warblers are quite a challenge and for many people they are the epitome of the LBJ, the little brown job. Um, but hopefully I will give you some clues as how to uh, 
address this challenge and how to actually enjoy watching warblers in the field because uh, India and North India in particular uh, is a wonderful place to see a great variety of interesting species. Now the key thing for uh, any exploring any group of birds, not just warblers, is to really get to know the common species and actually one of the benefits of the lockdown means that um, one has time to look at the birds that are in, your, in the garden or around where you live and these are likely to be common species and so take the opportunity of really getting to understand them well. Um, and so in North Delhi for example, in, in, in North India for example, um, time spent looking closely and continually at birds like the Hume's leaf warbler, common chiff chaff, blithe reed warbler or lesser white throat will pay off enormously. Um, you'll get to understand the variety that there is within a particular species, the variety of plumage at different times of the year, younger birds, older birds, and all of that knowledge will then help you uh, when you're confronting a species that is less common and you'll be clear about what the differences are. Now, what is the particular challenge with warblers, apart from the fact that superficially they all look the same. Well, partly it's hard to get a long look of the whole bird. They're very active, they're constantly on the move and very often hiding in vegetation. So it can be a bit frustrating. It's quite different from say watching a shorebird or, or, or a duck. Some birds like to feed right high in the tree and if the tree's got foliage, it can be very hard to get any uh, glimpse of the bird and you're straining your neck and your chances are that you're looking into the sunshine and so in the dappled light it's very hard to get any easy view of the bird. Others are feeding low down, perhaps they may be very skulking, hiding in low vegetation. So again, you're getting very brief views. So the golden rule is just to be, keep still and be patient. Let the bird uh, show itself from time to time. Don't try and sort of plunge in, just keep still. And over a few minutes, what you'll be obtaining will be a series of views of, of the bird. Now, in the talk, uh, I've drawn uh, largely on photographs from the Oriental Bird Photo um, Library and uh, the, photo uh, the photos I've used, I've acknowledged the photographer on the, on the slide. Um, so this one is a, is a photograph by uh, Girish Ketka. Um, I'll try and mention the photographer's names, but if not, the name is always on the slide. So, what are the key things to look for with warblers in these short glimpses that you're getting of these little birds? Well, try to take a look at the bill, see what the colour of the bill is. The leg colour is also important. Is it a dark leg or a pale leg? Is it rather fleshy colour? Head markings are the next thing to, to, to look for. Um, many warblers have uh, strong uh, supercilia stripes above the eye. They may have marks through the eye itself. They may have crown stripes. Check to see whether the warbler has got any markings on the wing. This might be, can, can you see the cursor on the, on the screen? This might be a wing bar or two wing bars even. Look also at the uh, feathers at the back of the wing here, the tertial feathers. Uh, that some of, sometimes those are quite strongly marked. The rump colour is also well worth looking, looking for. You know, is, it, uh, is the colour of the rump distinct from that on the rest of the, the back? How would you describe the colour on the rump? The plumage tones can be important, but take care here. Um, it's how you describe the colour of the overall plumage 
um, is also always quite subjective and it's also uh, strongly influenced by the light. Uh, a bird uh, can look quite a different colour in the shade compared with in strong sunlight. The colour of the plumage will vary during the course of the year. Birds in fresh plumage will look brighter than birds in worn plumage. Uh, in, when birds are in warm plumage, the plumage often looks quite grey and subdued. Juvenile birds will have a uh, will be in fresh plumage and look quite bright compared with adults. So be careful with the plumage tones. It's something to be aware of, but other more specific features of the appearance of the bird will actually be more helpful. The behavior of the bird is really important. And when I go through some of the species uh, in, in the talk, you'll see uh, uh, how some of the species have particular behaviours that help to identify them to, to a species level. And then finally, the call. This is extremely important for many uh, species. And uh, luckily, warblers do tend to call, call quite a lot. In fact, that's one of the best ways to find them if they're in dense vegetation. On the behaviour, um, take uh, a look when it's feeding. Warblers spend a lot of time foraging because mostly they're feeding on small insects. So they need to be active during, uh, for, for most of the day because uh, the items of food that they're feeding on are, are very small. So they have to keep feeding for many hours. So that does give you an opportunity of looking at the behaviour of the bird. Um, some warblers hover a lot. Um, some birds, when they move through the vegetation, may cock their tail up or quiver their tail. Some birds will flick their wings. And also, where is it feeding? Is it at the top of the tree? Is it in the middle of the bush? Is it on the ground? Is it next to water? All of these are important things to keep a note of because they will help to identify the warbler that you're looking at. Now, when I was uh, in, in India um, nearly 20 years ago, um, we had to resort pretty much to notebooks. And uh, the key thing was to keep notes of what you were seeing, just jot things down and then consult the field guide afterwards if you're trying to work out what the bird is that, that you've, you've seen and you weren't, able, you weren't able to identify it straight off. Uh, nowadays, um, most people also are carrying cameras, um, bridge cameras like I have or, 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 or SLRs. And so it's most people are able to supplement their notes or even substitute notes for, for a series of photographs. Uh, it's often quite useful if you can to get a video of a bird as well because that captures the behavior nicely. And Nowadays also, uh, with one's um, uh, mobile phones, you can record the sounds of birds easily. And so the technology available for recording what you're seeing in the field has uh, utterly transformed the uh, opportunities and the ease of being able to um, collect information. And it's very easy with photographs and sound recordings to then share them on online groups or send them to people who you think may be able to help. And uh, this all is very, very helpful uh, to identify the bird. Um, but I still think that it's helpful if you carry a notebook to jot down a few things as well, because um, photographs are great, uh, but they don't always capture what is the essential character of the bird, if you like, about how it's moving and so on. And sometimes a little description can help you. But with all of these things, try to get information from the field before you start then looking at the bird book. That's the, the golden rule, um, so that you don't start getting influenced by what the book says. You've got a clear idea of what you've seen, and then you compare that with what the book tells you. Now, I'm going to talk about three, uh, the three main groups of warblers, um, the philoscopus warblers, the leaf warblers, the acrocephalus warblers or the reed warblers, 
and the sylvia warblers or the, the scrub warblers uh, i will mention a few other warblers during the course of the talk that don't fall into these three groups but these are the three principal groups of warblers um, that you will find uh, in india across asia and 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 in europe and they're they're quite distinctive distinct um, uh, groups. The Philoscopus warblers are small, uh, delicate, fine uh, warblers uh, with generally a greenish uh, toned plumage. The Acrocephalus warblers, the reed warblers, are generally browner um, and have pointed heads, flattened foreheads. The name Acrocephalus comes from um, the description of the, uh, of the shape of the head. It means pointed pointed head. And then the scrub warblers tend to be rather um, heavier birds, have certainly got heavier bills, and their plumage is dominated by greys and blacks. So let's start with the Philoscopus warblers, which arguably are the most beautiful uh, of the uh, warblers. These are the small, delicate warblers. They are rather dainty, they've got fine bills, they feed uh, on insects. The bills tend to be finer and shorter than with the Acrocephalus warblers. They've often got rather short tails, sometimes slightly forked or slightly, slightly kef, uh, cleft. They are extremely active. They flit around, they flick their wings, they hover. Um, they're constantly on the move, which makes them quite difficult to, to get long, prolonged views of. And so you're getting little glimpses of them the whole time. And it's what I would call jigsaw birding. You imagine you're doing a, a jigsaw puzzle and you've got different pieces and you're trying to fit them all together. Well, watching a philoscopus warbler, a leaf warbler, is a bit like that. You're getting a glimpse of the side of the head for a second and then the bird disappears. The next view of the bird you get, you see part of its wing. The next view is a little bit of its underparts. The next view is the top of its crown. And you're trying to sort of see how that all fits together to make something uh, uh, that is then identifiable as a, as a whole bird. So it is extremely challenging. And this is where you need to be patient and just give it, give it time. And uh, this is where a notebook can be very helpful. So you're quickly jotting down the bits and pieces that you see of the bird. And with the Philoscopus warblers, there are two main groups in terms of their appearance. What I would describe as the rather plain looking Philoscopus warblers and the ones which are patterned. And so we'll look at the plain ones first. And the common plain looking Philoscopus warbler uh, it's a bird which I'm sure all of you know is the common chiff chaff and it's a very common winter visitor. Uh, it's a bird which is uh, a fine bill. Uh, the bill is dark, the legs are dark. Often it shows a little white crescent or half crescent around the eye. Um, it's got a rather faint supercilium, a slightly darker line through the eye. Uh, sometimes they will show some uh, rather olive green edgings on the, on the wing feathers there, on the flight feathers. Um, it's a fairly, overall, a fairly nondescript uh, warbler, not strongly marked in any way, but it is the common warbler and it's the one to really you know, get, get to know well. Sometimes they have a little bit of yellow showing here at the, if you like, the shoulder of, of the wing. Now I've got two photographs here on this slide um, because chiff chaffs are uh, a widely distributed species right across um, Eurasia and um, they form various different subspecies. And the ones that are, uh, you'll get in uh, North India are the uh, pre pre uh, predominantly the Tristis, the Siberian chiffchaff, um, which this bird here is on the on the left. 
The bird on the right is also a common chiff chaff. It's a photograph I took in Spain uh, of a wintering common chiff chaff. And this is the nominate race. Uh, so this is the species that occurs in the subspecies occurring in Western Europe. And as you can see, it's slightly more greeny olive than the rather browner looking Siberian uh, chiff chaff. Then it shares the dark legs, dark bill, little white uh, crescent around the eye. Um, so chiff chaffs are quite a complex group. Uh, and according to some taxonomists, um, you know, some people would consider, say, the Siberian chiff chaff as a distinct species, but generally it's treated as a, a subspecies, uh, a, a subspecies of common chiff chaff. Um, in Spain, we have an Iberian chiff chaff, which is a separate species. There's a separate species of chiff chaff on the Canary Islands in the Atlantic. Um, and uh, there are also, there's a different race that occurs in the um, northern part of uh, Europe, Arctic, Arctic Europe. So it's a species uh, which shows a great deal of variability. But generally a bird which is rather brownish, slightly, slightly olive tone, uh, but dark legs and dark and dark bill. Now here we have the mountain chiff chaff, sometimes called the Kashmir uh, chiff chaff, which is a bird uh, which is very easy to see if you go up to Ladakh. Um, but it's a bird which potentially you know, could occur in small numbers uh, uh, wintering uh, south of the Himalayas. Um, it's, it's a bird which shows none of that rather olivey uh, uh, edging on the wing that the uh, common chiff chaff shows and the shoulder uh, if it is uh, exposed will often appear rather whitish rather than yellowish but rather similar indeed to the the common chiff chaff so I'm just putting up there as a, a, a bird which um, if you do go up to Ladakh you'll be able to see um, with the chiff chaffs the calls are quite important and the call of the mountain chiff chaff is really different from that of the of the common chiff chaff and largely it's the calls that have been used to to separate taxonomically um, some of the rather complex chiff chaff group now another rather plain looking warbler which uh, you will find in the winter uh, around Delhi uh, is the sulfur bellied warbler and this is uh, an example of a species where the behavior is uh, particularly interesting and it's a real clue to its identity. This is a bird which uh, feeds in a very distinctive characteristic way um, either on the ground or on rocks or on tree trunks often behaving a little bit like a nuthatch uh, and so its feeding behavior is quite different from other warblers. In terms of its uh, appearance, what's striking about the sulfur bellied warbler is this very bold yellowish supercilium. And that supercilium is the brightest part of the whole bird. It has this, it's called sulfur bellied, and the, the, it has this rather yellowish tone on the belly as well, but the re really is uh, the brightest part is the supercilium. So it should really be called like the sulfur browed warbler or something like that, because that really is the, the, the bright distinctive part of the bird. You see how the legs are, are pale, uh, fleshy colored legs, quite different from that of the chiff chaff, which have got dark legs. And the bill also has got this uh, pale lower mandible. Another uh, warbler, which is probably more, it's an uncommon winter visitor, but it may be more regular, more, uh, more common than people think because it's very skulking. This is the smoky warbler. And this is a very, very uniform looking warbler um, that spends its time in wet habitats mainly feeding really low, close to the ground, skulking through 
um, uh, the emergent vegetation at the side of small pools and, and, and ditches. Uh, what's striking about it, it's rather short-tailed in appearance and otherwise the, the plumage is, is, as the name suggests, very smoky, greyish, smoky sort of colour, very dark legs and bill and uh, hardly any supercilium, so very little in terms of features to, to look at. And this is an, another example of a bird which um, its behavior is one of its the biggest clues. Uh, you know, a bird skulking around, uh, looking very nondescript, uh, really dark gray, uh, at the base of vegetation in wet habitats in the winter um, is likely to be a smoky warbler. Okay, um, now there are some other rather plain looking warblers, which I, you know, I, I won't go through uh, in detail, birds like dusky warbler and so on. Um, in uh, Nick Hill's uh, um, book, The uh, Birds About Delhi, um, there's uh, a section there on the warblers. Uh, Nick will ask me to, to do the text for those, those particular, uh, that particular group of birds. And so you'll see a much more fuller accounts uh, of a, a number of other species that we're not going to um, take, take a look at today. I'm now going to look at the Philosophus warblers, which are patterned. And the familiar one uh, to you uh, in, in North India will be the Hume's leaf warbler. And this is a very common uh, bird, um, a bird that one can find, often locating it by its distinctive uh, uh, call in parklands and gardens. Um, it's a bird, when you look at it, it's, it's, very, uh, it's a small warbler, quite compact looking. Um, so the head looks quite large compared with the body. The, again, uh, dark legs, rather dark bill. And the, the overall plumage is rather grayish, olive gray. Um, a pale supercilium, rather uh, off-white off supercilium, pale wing bar, sometimes shows a little bit of a second wing bar, again rather whitish wing bar. And what's striking about the Hume's leaf warbler are the very pale uh, edgings to the, uh, these feathers here, which are the tertial feathers. And so they look very highly patterned, which is not something that you would see, say, with the chiff chaff. So that is a very distinctive feature, the Hume's leaf warbler. Uh, it's a very active bird, tending to feed um, fairly high up in the trees and calls quite a lot. It's one of the distinctive sounds in the winter in the parks. And I'm putting this picture in uh, because uh, this is a yellow-browed warbler and this is actually one of my pictures and um, this the Hume's uh, leaf warbler used to be thought of as a subspecies in the old days of the yellow-browed warbler. Um, the, uh, it's now been separated um, and it really is quite a different looking bird. Um, the yellow-browed warbler um, superficially has the same sort of strong supercilium, strong wing bar, strongly patterned uh, tertials, but you can see the legs are pale. Um, it's, a, it's a more moss, moss Okay, can, can everyone see? Right, okay, so I, I was just, just wanted to say the reason why I'm showing the yellow-browed warbler is that um, there are some very interesting things happening with, with migration. And over the last uh, few years, um, the numbers of yellow-browed warblers uh, occurring in Western Europe have increased enormously. And uh, it's a bird which breeds in uh, Siberia and 
winters mainly in Southeast Asia. But uh, in the last few years, there's been huge increase in the number of uh, yellow-browed warblers migrating through Western Europe. And with evidence now of birds overwintering in, uh, in Spain, in North Africa, uh, and in islands in the um, Atlantic, like the Canary Islands and the Azores. And, uh, you know, what seems to be happening is that part of the population of yellow-browed warblers have evolved in the last few decades uh, to migrate to change their migratory pattern and to be uh, migrating through, through Western Europe and uh, wintering in the southwest of Europe instead of Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, it's whether this is because this particular species is, is slowly spreading to the west. There are a number of other Asian species which are becoming more frequently seen now in, in Western Europe. So, um, you know, some in the autumn in the north of Scotland, this yellow-browed warbler can migration, a remarkable um, cha change of events. And I just wanted to give that example just to show people how dynamic uh, bird distributions are. And it isn't simply a case of people uh, being more observant and more observers being out. This looks like a genuine change in migratory patterns, um, a shift of some of the population of this species. And if it can happen with yellow-browed warblers, it can certainly happen with other species too. A lot of the wintering warblers, well, all of the wintering warblers in, in India are coming from, from further north. And um, you know what may be patterns that have been understood for many decades, they could be subject to change, whether this is to do with climate change or other factors, um, we don't yet know. But um, this is why things like eBird and the uh, citizen science is just so valuable because it's the best way for people involved in studying these species to really see what's going on over uh, uh, and trends and patterns from one year to the next. Now this is uh, Brooks's leaf warbler and photo by, by Nick Hill. And this is really one of the specialities, one of the highlights of birding in the winter uh, in, uh, around Delhi in North, North, North India. Um, I saw my first Brooks's leaf warbler at Sultanpur and it's a warbler which uh, occurs uh, particularly in rather dry uh, acacia uh, dominated uh, scrub. It feeds uh, usually quite high in the tree and they do appear to occupy territories, winter territories, which probably most of the Philoscopus warblers uh, uh, do. And because certainly once you've located a particular Brooks's leaf warbler along a particular patch of trees, the chances are if you go back again, it will be there. Uh, it's a very active little warbler, um, spends a lot of time hovering, which gives you a good opportunity of being able to see its pale rump. Uh, it's a rather yellowish toned, buffish toned um, warbler. So, you know, quite different from the Humes warbler. Look at the, look at the bill there, rather orangey, a pale, pale bill. And this, you know, rather warm plumage, quite different from the rather gray flecking on the, um, on, on, on the, on the Humes leaf warbler. A very special bird indeed. And I must confess, my favourite of all of the Philoscopus warblers uh, that one will encounter in North India uh, is the lemon rumped warbler, a real little gem amongst gems, as I've put on the slide, uh, a gorgeous uh, little bird with a bright yellow rump, um, a crown stripe, a pale crown stripe, which uh, on this photograph you can't quite see. But the reason why I've use this photograph again of Nikhil is that it has this very distinctive, it's a diagnostic 
little comma, like a, like a punctuation mark, a comma, little black uh, outline to the, to the feathers on the, on the cheek there, on the ear coverts. And, um, you know, that's something that is easy to spot in the field. Um, a lot of the warblers in, in the winter will join other birds and uh, follow flocks in, in, in working through the trees. Uh, looking for food and which means they're constantly active it can be a bit confusing because you start looking at one particular individual and you get distracted by another one and so it can be a little bit overwhelming uh, but it is um, a wonderful way of being able to once you've located a flock of being able to treat yourself to spotting different species uh, all together uh, and then as you watch them, you'll notice that they're feeding in different ways. They've each got their own particular niche that they're occupying in, in this winter flock. Uh, the other uh, distinctive uh, patterned uh, Philosopher's Warbler in the area um, close to Delhi uh, and the foothills of the Himalayas is the Western Crowned Warbler. Um, quite a striking head pattern. Uh, with a, a pale, bold, pale crown stripe, a very, very prominent supercilium. But look at the bill, very pale bill, uh, orangey yellow bill, um, that makes it much bigger than it really is. It just, you know, it gives an optical illusion. It really just stand out. It, sh you know, shouts. It's, uh, it's as if it's sort of shouting its presence up. Uh, and a very striking feature to, to look for. Um, but so the combination of this very bright bill and the strong head pattern, um, it makes this quite a, quite a distinctive warbler, again, of the uh, Himalayan um, woodlands. And then um, there's the greenish warbler, which is uh, quite a confusing one because it's... Um, it's not strongly patterned, but it neither is it particularly plain. So it's a little bit sort of in the middle. Uh, they will usually show uh, the greenish warbler a pale wing bar, but this can sometimes be quite indistinct. Occasionally even shows a little bit of a second wing bar. Um, so the wing bar is usually visible, but it's sometimes missing. Um, but what, uh, helps you then identify it from a chiff chaff uh, which doesn't show a wing bar is the very uh, long and rather narrow pale supercilium which extends well beyond the eye um, and uh, the bird has got a more greenish tone than the more browner uh, of the of, of the chiff chaff but it is a um, uh, it can be a quite a confusing bird. Um, the call is different from a chiff chaff, but some of its calls can be a little bit like the Hume's leaf warbler. So again, it's a question of locating the bird, uh, a calling bird, and then trying to get a good view of it. It's uh, a quite a, a quite a common passage migrant and and, and scarce winter migrant. And you know this is all classic habitat, winter habitat, where you can go uh, and, and find variety of different Philoscopus species. Um, they, they, it's a bird. It's a group of warblers that will feed mainly in trees and bushes. Uh, the ex exception really is the chiff chaff, common chiff chaff, which often does feed on the ground, particularly next to wet areas. And then the smoky warbler and the sulphur-bellied warblers, which have, as I described, have got quite distinct feeding behavior. But the, the warblers, which are, are, are marked patterned warblers, are generally up in the foliage, uh, hence the name leaf warbler. So um, now the Philoscopus warblers are fairly straightforward compared to this next group, which are the Acrocephalus, or so I've put Acrocephaline because I also include in this group um, two very closely related warblers to the Acrocephalus warblers, which is the booted and Sykes warblers. So I'll, I'll 
cover all considered to be acrocephaline, which is a broad category of warblers, uh, which are typically rather brownish uh, uh, and rather buffy, pale underparts. And the tails are rounded. And as I said at the beginning, uh, the word acrocephalus actually means a pointed head. And so um, the warblers in this group are, have quite flat foreheads, uh, quite different from the rather rounded heads of the uh, Philoscopus warblers. And generally, the uh, acrocephalus warblers are associated with wet habitats like marshes, uh, reed beds, um, uh, bushes in damp areas. But you know, some of them will occur in dry habitats as well. They are very difficult to see. Um, Philoscopus warblers are extremely active. They're flitting around. You don't get long views of Philoscopus warblers, but um, you can generally pick them up, appearing between the leaves and disappearing again. The Acrocephalus warblers are generally hiding in quite dense vegetation. And they can be that much more difficult to see. They don't have that um, high level of activity that the um, Philoscopus warblers they have. They're rather more sluggish, rather slower. But the advantage is that they do tend to call a lot, which does help you to locate them. And with the Acrocephalus warblers, the most important thing to look at, first of all, when you do get a glimpse of the bird, is its head. And the, the common Acrocephalus warbler, which uh, it's well worth really trying to get to know well, because that will be the benchmark then that you can compare other uh, Acrocephalus warblers with, is the Blythe's reed warbler. Um, a common passage migrant and uh, with some birds overwintering. Most of them are wintering in, in, in southern India. And uh, it's a bird which, as you can see on the picture here, picture by Sumit uh, Sengupta, um, the rather flattened forehead typical of this type of warbler, um, pale legs, uh, a bill which uh, is paler on the lower mandible. The overall plumage tone is a sort of a dull olivey brown. Um, the tail rounded, buff, buffy underneath. And But let's look at the head. And the thing to notice with the Blythe's reed warbler is that the pale area on the head, the supercilium, uh, is prominent before the eye, but then more or less disappears after the eye. So um, it's quite a short supercilium, uh, predominantly in front of this dark, dark eye. It's a warbler which um, can often be found away from uh, water, particularly on, on migration. Uh, I remember in, in Delhi in uh, the spring, there would often be Blythe's reed warblers in our garden singing from, 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 from the trees. Um, so uh, although they are usually uh, in, in wetter habitats, uh, you can find them in areas where with, away from water in trees and bushes in the winter and, and on passage. So the other um, warbler that you're likely to come across if you're exploring that sort of habitat, this sort of wet, wet margins uh, of, of marshes uh, in amongst dense vegetation is the paddy field warbler. And the paddy field warbler is, uh, has certain features uh, which will help you identify it from a blithe reed. And let's again look closely at the head because that is the most important part of the bird to, to study. With the Blythe reed warbler, the supercilium was mainly in front of the eye. The paddy field warbler has got a much longer supercilium, which gets wider behind the eye, extends well beyond the eye and gets actually quite wide beyond the eye. It's wider, uh, it's a, a, a larger area behind the eye than in front of the eye. So quite different proportions to that shown by the Blythe reed warbler. The other thing as well is that it often has this rather dark little mark line, the border 
between the crown feathers and the supercilium, as if it's got a nice little neat border to the supercilium there. Um, the bill, uh, this particular photograph doesn't show it so well, but often has a fairly distinct little dark tip. And the overall colour of the bird is um, a warmer, a warmer brown, um, particularly on the rump, it can look quite, quite warm brown compared with the rather colder olivey brown of the blithe reed warbler. But do remember the warning I gave at the beginning about talking about the general colour of the plumage, it does vary. And juvenile blithe reed warblers in the autumn can also look quite um, warm brown looking. Uh, they're much warmer, particularly on the rump, than the adults are. But they uh, will not show this very distinctive long supercilium that the paddy field warbler has. And then the other common uh, acrocephalus warbler, which is a resident species, it's one of the few warblers that we're covering, uh, which is uh, a resident bird, is the clamorous reed warbler. It's a very easy bird to see. Um, uh, places like Ocla. Um, and what's striking about the Klamath reed warbler is its size. I mean, it's a real monster. Um, it's almost the size of a bulbul, um, so significantly, significantly bigger than uh, the Blythe reed warbler and Paddyfield warbler. Um, the head pattern, again, let's focus on the head. The head pattern is, is, is a little bit like a Blythe reed warbler. The supercilium is stronger in front of the island, is behind. But look at that huge bill, a massive bill. It's even, you know, gives the impression of being slightly curved. Um, it is a, you know, truly uh, monstrous bill compared with the proportions of the bill shown by the, the Blythe reed and, and the paddy field warbler. So it's a very distinct warbler. Um, purely on its size and this and this big bill. And I mean, what's interesting with the clamorous reed warbler and the closely related great reed warbler, which occurs um, uh, to uh, in, in uh, further north and, 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 and uh, particularly in Western Europe as well, is that these two large uh, reed warblers have quite a wide uh, variety of, in their diet. So they're not just feeding on insects, um, they are even known to predate the nestlings of uh, small birds. So, you know, they are in, in effect quite uh, predatory, predatory in their, in their uh, behaviour in, uh, in reed beds. Um, they nest in very large concentrations. Um, so, uh, because they're living in a habitat where there's so much food, um, you can get really high concentrations of clamorous reed warblers all nesting together, whereas Blythe reed warbler on the breeding grounds um, have much larger territories because they are in areas where they can't find as much food. Now the other, uh, another acrocephalus warbler, um, which is a quite a distinct uh, looking one, uh, which you can find if you're lucky in the uh, in North India, is the moustached warbler. Uh, this uh, again, let's look at the head. Um, a very very bold supercilium, uh, whitish supercilium, and getting very extensive and and flanging out, getting quite wide behind the eye. The cheek is a distinctive grey. Uh, cheek there, crown is 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 dark, particularly along the border here. So it's a very striking head pattern, and unlike the other acrocephalus warblers that we've seen so far, this has also got some streaks on the on the back. Uh, it's a very rich brown in colour, and look at its behaviour, cocking its its tail up. This. Um, is a very skulking species that likes to feed right at the water's edge. It will emerge from dense vegetation uh, and cling on to the stems of uh, the typha, these uh, 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 bull, bulrushes here, uh, clinging on to the stems and reaching down to pick off insects at the edge of the water. The tail often cocked and then it will disappear again into the, into the vegetation. 
So it doesn't tend to climb up into the vegetation high and you're very unlikely to see it in bushes or in trees. So this is a bird to look for at the edges of swamps, um, particularly where there's a lot of matted vegetation uh, at the water's edge where they'll be coming out and feed on the edge there, uh, of the water. Um, Bassai uh, was uh, a, a good area for moustached warblers. And I'm just throwing this one in because um, I know that Mike Prince saw this on his part of his lockdown birding from his from his garden or uh, uh, house balcony, a thick billed warbler. Um, and it doesn't look like an acrocephalus warbler at all. In fact, it looks a little bit like a bulbul. Um, very uh, aberrant uh, uh, warbler for, for this group of warblers. And it's a bird, you know, which potentially could occur in the uh, area around Delhi. Um, uh, it occurs mainly in uh, eastern India in the winter, uh, breeding up in, in Russia. Uh, as its name suggests, the bill is short, and, and thick, quite different looking from any of the other uh, warblers that we've seen. A rather small head and this extremely long tail compared with the size of the body. So a very, very distinctive look, looking bird. Now, um, I'm putting in these two warblers, uh, this is Sykes and Booted warblers. Um, these are not acrocephalus, they uh, they are Iduna, uh, their genus is Iduna, but the Iduna genus of warblers are considered to be very closely related to the Acrocephalus, and so that they are all put into this one big group called the Acrocephaline warblers. And as you can see, um, these are uh, uh, rather plain looking, uh, rather brownish looking, so sort of fitting the bill for, for an Acrocephalus warbler in those general terms. Um, these are really difficult to uh, identify and this is where you need a great deal of care and a lot of luck and to be able to, to watch these birds at length. These, these are not, not easy. Um, they used to be considered to be the same species in fact. Uh, boot, they, always, they used to be called both booted warblers um, and they've been fairly recently split into the Sykes and booted warblers. Both of them occur in, in North India in the winter. Both of them like rather drier habitats, often uh, acacia um, scrub, and are feeding mainly in, in the trees. Uh, what's distinctive about the Aduna warblers is that uh, the tail is um, square ended, difficult to see in these photographs, but they are a square ended tails rather than rounded ended like the uh, acrocephalus warblers, like the reed warblers. They also show a white edge on the outer feather of the tail and you can just about see that in the photograph on the right. Um, not easy to see here in the photograph on, on the left and it's not easy to see in the field but if you do see a rather brown looking, plain looking warbler with a white outer edge of the tail, then that means you're looking at a, a, an Iduna warbler. And how do you separate these two? Well, um, in a sense, the Sykes warbler reminds one a bit more of a Acrocephalus. It's a bit like a Blythe reed warbler, perhaps. It's got that sort of uh, rather, you know, shallow forehead, um, the size, the proportions of the bird are a little bit more like a, uh, an acrocephalus warbler, a bit like a blithe reed warbler. The booted warbler is, it's more dainty, it's more delicate looking and it reminds one more actually of a chiff chaff. Um, so the bill is uh, quite fine, whereas the bill of the Sykes warbler is, is, is a bit heavier. Both of them, and this is another characteristic of the Iduna warblers, both of them have quite wide bases of the bill. So if you see the bird head on or from below, the base of the bill of the booted warbler and the Sykes warbler is quite broad. 
much broader than say with a chiff chaff or with a, uh, a blithe reed warbler. The um, Sykes's warbler has got, is rather more sort of sandy uh, color. Um, the booted warbler is rather sort of uh, darker, browner color. But again, these are all quite subtle differences. So um, look for Iduna warblers in rather open uh, scrubby habitat in the winter. Um, look for tail, they often they look for the, ev any evidence of this pale edge to the tail. They both characteristically flick their wings and tail um, quite a lot. Um, but these are headaches and so don't worry if you struggle with these. Um, sooner or later the penny will drop uh, but they, they, are, they are difficult birds. And I'm putting this one in, but it's not an acrocephalus warbler. Um, it's a, a locustella warbler, so it's a group of warblers which I'm not going to, to, to touch upon in this talk, but I'm putting this one in because um, I actually saw this individual bird with Garima when she took the photograph. So um, I, I do have a, a actual memory of seeing this particular individual. Um, grasshopper warblers are uh, scarce winter visitors to North India. Um, they are likely to be heavily under-recorded because they are extremely skulking. They are a member of a group of warblers called the Locustella warblers, which are, uh, most of them are heavily marked uh, with streaks and spots. Um, and what's interesting about them is that there is their behavior is that they generally are very skulking. They keep close to the ground. They often creep around like, like mice. Um, and the song of most Locustella warblers um, is uh, quite different from other warblers. Um, it's not musical. It's almost mechanical sounding. It's like a reeling, um, uh, long continuous set of notes. Uh, it's well worth uh, looking on the internet and listening to the song of Grasshopper Warbler just to just 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 to hear what a weird song it is. Um, they're generally silent on the winter grounds and you're very very lucky indeed to see one, even luckier to get a photograph like this. Um, but it's a rather you know gorgeous looking bird in its in its subtle interesting way. And finally, we um, will look at the uh, group of warblers called the Sylvia warblers. And these are the, um, often called the scrub warblers. And these are uh, quite, a, quite distinct from the other warblers that we've looked at. Uh, they tend to have quite thick bills compared with the leaf warblers or reed warblers. And that's because their diet is quite varied. Um, the Philoscus warblers feed pretty exclusively on insects. The Acrocephalus warblers will feed mainly on insects, but you know they will take uh, larger invertebrates. And Clamorous reed warbler, even as I say, may may predate nests and would certainly take small lizards and so on. But um, the Sylvia warblers will feed. Uh, on insects like other warblers, but will also feed on berries and fruit, uh, particularly on migration and in the winter. So their bills tend to be rather thicker um, than the pincer-like bills of the Philoscopus warblers. The other interesting thing about the uh, Sylvia warblers is that plumage tends to be quite bold, um, striking. Uh, they don't have wing bars or eye stripes. Um, some of them have quite uh, big differences between male and female plumage, which is completely different from the other warblers that we've been looking at. With, all, with the Philoscopus warblers, with the reed warblers, the male and female plumage is identical. Um, with the Sylvia warblers, you can tell the male from the female. And often with the Sylvia warblers, the eye color is uh, important too. Now, Sylvia warblers have their 
greatest diversity in the Mediterranean region. And I'm just, just showing you a set of the Sylvia warblers that I can see um, if I'm not under lockdown at this time of the year. Uh, but all of these are within 20 minutes from where I live. Uh, spectacled warblers, Sardinian warblers, Dartford warblers, subalpine warblers. And as you can see, we're looking at a set of birds completely different from the types of plumage that we've seen with the Acrocephalus warblers and the Sylvia warblers. Very striking plumage. Um, I oft, uh, uh, sometimes with these uh, colored uh, bare or orbital rings, of, uh, uh, bare skin around the eye. Um, male is, is bright, the female more subdued in plumage. And so when you see them side by side, very diff easy to tell male and female. And their songs all tend to be rather similar, quite scratchy uh, and fairly simple songs. Now, in winter in, uh, in, in, in North India, um, the lesser white throat is the common uh, wintering Sylvia warbler. And uh, this is a warbler with a pale throat and the ear coverts, the cheek here, is dark. And depending on the race of lesser white throat, um, the crown can be quite pale to contrast with the darker cheek, or it sometimes can be more or less the same, same colour. Um, sometimes the head will be much greyer than the back, sometimes it will again be the similar sort of colour. So the problem with lesser white throats is that you have a variety of different subspecies. Some of these are quite distinct, some of them are treated as full species now by some authorities. Um, the jury is out. Um, it depends who you want to use as your authority. Um, but when you're out in the field, you will see a variety of different lesser white throats. And so it's well worth trying to get photographs of the different ones that you're seeing, and then trying to work out which race, which subspecies the lesser white throat belongs to. Um, this is where a camera getting good photographs really makes the difference because um, quite often you're looking at subtle differences between the colour of the head and the back, uh, subtle differences between the tone of the plumage on the side of the head and the top of the head, which could be quite difficult to describe properly in a notebook. If you get a good picture with nice light, uh, you can then at your leisure uh, work out where that lesser white throat would have come from. Now the other uh, Sylvia warbler, which uh, you will come across, will be the Orphean warbler or Eastern Orphean warbler. And this, uh, I'll sh uh, this has got the, the two pictures here. The one on the left reminds one a little bit of that lesser white throat. Um, the rather pale throat, uh, dark on the side of the head, slightly paler perhaps on the crown, uh, the same, very same tones of grey and brown as the lesser white throat showed. The difference though is this bird is a lot bigger and look at that bill, a really large heavy bill. This is almost like the Sylvia equivalent of the clamorous reed warbler. It's not as big as a clamorous reed warbler but it's still strikingly bigger than the lesser white throat and uh, it's, its size makes it rather clumsy, so it tends to sort of make heavy progress through the bushes when it's looking, looking for prey to, to feed on. Um, lesser white throats are much more agile and, 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 and uh, streamlined. And uh, with these two photographs, I'm showing you the difference between um, a uh, uh, a juvenile or immature plumage, so this is a bird in the autumn, and an adult uh, Orphean warbler. And first of all, you can just see this is actually a, a male as well, so it's really absolutely beautiful male adult Orphean warbler. The female is a little bit more like the juvenile in, in plumage, but what's striking with the adult, and this is something to look for carefully in the field, look at its eye. It, so the eye uh, is white, 
Uh, and even with the juvenile bird, the eye is pale gray. And here, but it, the adult, it's almost white, a very, very distinctive eye that stands out against this black um, uh, top of the head. Again, massive bill, um, really heavy, big, chunky warbler. Um, and it's a, it's a typical example of the case when, uh, if you've never seen an Orphean warbler and you're looking in the bird book and you're trying to work out well, will I be able to tell it apart from a lesser white throat? They look quite similar. How do I tell them apart? And you're looking at lesser white throats in the field and you go, mm, um, ah, is that a lesser white throat? Or is it possibly an Orphean warbler? And then you see an Orphean warbler. And then you realize that there's actually, when you confronted with the real thing, there's no ifs or buts or ums or ahs. Uh, you, you can tell straight away that you're looking at a bird which is just much bigger, different shape, different behavior from, from, the, from the lesser white throat. And very often that the, the general golden rule is that, you know, when you're confronted with a pair of species and one is common, common more common, or you see it more frequently than the, the other one, and you're never sure whether you've seen the rarer one or not, if you're in doubt, the chances are you're looking at the familiar one, the common one. Uh, because when you do see, at last, the bird that you've been looking for, you suddenly realize, well, what was the confusion all about? It's so distinctive. So Orphean warblers really do stand out. Um, and a uh, very interesting warbler indeed. Um, and finally, the other Sylvia warbler, which uh, uh, has been recorded in the Delhi area and you can come across uh, particularly in um, uh, if you go to uh, in Gujarat and places like that is the common white throat sometimes called the greater white throat and this uh, is quite easy to tell apart from the lesser white throat um, it's slightly bigger than a lesser white throat not anywhere near the size of an Orphean warbler um, the eye is dark and like the lesser white throat, it has this pale, pale throat. But notice that the head um, uh, doesn't have this rather dark uh, uh, ear, ear patch uh, cheek. Um, the plumage tone is the same right from uh, below the eye right to the crown. Um, it depends whether it's a male or female or a young bird and an adult. Sometimes this will be brownish, sometimes it will be greyish. But the key, key, key thing is that the tone of the plumage is all the same. Whereas with a lesser white throat, um, it's this, this area around and, and uh, covering the ears is uh, a very dis a, a, a distinct patch. And the other uh, clear difference between the common white throat and lesser white throat is these nice reddish chestnut, warm brownish edgings to the uh, flight feathers and the covered feathers. So the wings have this uh, very warm brownish tone, which if I go back to the lesser white throat, you'll see um, this is a uniform uh, grayish olivey brown color. The common white throat has got this rusty, rust, rusty brown, markings on the on the wings. Okay, um, I'm going to try to draw to a close now. Um, I've, I've had a love affair with warblers ever since I, um, well I was going to say ever since I did actually a PhD on them. I did a PhD on acrocephalus warblers and I was looking at aspects of their uh, reproductive behavior and ecology um, some of them do some very, very uh, uh, naughty things. And uh, so that's another story, uh, the, the sex life of the acrocephalus warbler. Um, but actually my love affair of warblers goes way, way, way back to when I was a child and uh, my father would take me out walking and point out warblers and get me to learn the songs of the warblers and to identify them. And then birding uh, in England in the autumn and with the thrill always of being able to find something like a yellow-browed warbler, um, a, a bird from 
distant lands turning up on migration as a rarity on, on the coast. So a thrill around seeing unusual warblers too. So uh, warblers have caught me ever since I was a little boy and I had the opportunity of spending many years doing research on them. It may have raised eyebrows amongst my friends. It's given me many unforgettable encounters and taken me to some magic places, not least some of the, some of my most favorite bird birding haunts, uh, which are in, in India. And I can't wait to, uh, to go back there. Um, so don't give up, um, just plod on with warblers. Um, and it, don't try, don't worry if you can't identify every single warbler that you see. Uh, no one, not even the experts, will always be able to identify uh, everything that they see. And uh, I think as actually, as you get more and more experienced, you become more and more modest and you do realize that there are some very tricky birds out there and you do need to get good views. Keep at it, it's a challenge and uh, I'm very happy if you want to uh, contact me at any time. My email is on the screen there. Um, uh, it'd be lovely to be in, in touch with um, colleagues and friends uh, in, in India. And who knows, we may be able to go birding together one day. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That was fantastic and very, very enriching like always. I think there are a few questions here. If you want to just go through them quickly. Okay. There's Gajinder wants to know the, diff, the does the common chiff chaff call in summer in India? Does it call in summer? In, in India? India. Uh, well, the, com the, the, the common chiff chaff is a winter visitor. So uh, you're unlikely to come across one in, in, in in the summer, unless you're up in Ladakh, where you'll be coming across mountain chief chaps mainly. Perfect. Next is Surinder Akaraju. He wants yep. to know how to differentiate between common chief chaff and willow warbler. Okay, well, that's a very good question. I mean, I didn't put willow warbler in because willow warblers are birds which are, they, they breed right across the um, uh, the Palearctic, uh, but winter in uh, mainly in southern Africa. Um, willow warblers are, it, it, when I talked about that going out with my father and he was helping me to identify tricky pairs of warblers, well, what the classic tricky pair of warblers to try to sort out are willow warblers and chiff chaffs because in Britain both of them occur. Um, the, the song is totally different so if you hear one singing then there's, there's no problem at all. Um, and I won't attempt to ident uh, imitate the song. You can easily find the song on the internet. But it, if you just see one, then um, willow warblers will have um, paler legs. So the first thing to look at is the legs and the bill. Um, chiff chaffs will have dark legs and dark bills. Willow warblers, paler legs and paler bills. That's one, one, one difference. Um, chief, uh, willow warblers tend to be more brighter looking, a, a brighter green um, than the, the chiff chaff, although there are some chiff chaff populations in Western Europe which can also look quite bright, so that's a subtle difference. There is a difference in the pattern on the side of the head, so that um, below the eye, um, the willow warbler has uh, a little area which is pale with a rather darker border to, uh, below it. So it's slightly more patterned on the cheek than, than, than a chiff chaff. Again, a very subtle difference, but you know, it, it, it's something to look out for. And um, willow warblers are long distance migrants. So they migrate all the way from um, Northern Palearctic right down to Southern Africa. Uh, so they have very long wings compared with chiff chaffs and so the uh, length of the wing uh, means that it the tip of the wing extends well beyond the rump to the base of the tail so it's, it, the whole bird looks a more slender more, more more pointed than the chiff chaff does okay 
Yeah, I think one more question here was greenish, okay. green, greenish, green and humes. Greenish, green and humes. Okay. Well, um, yeah, they. I mean, greenish and green. Let's look at those two first of all. I mean, those those are very tricky pair. Um, and in fact, some people consider them to be the same species, simply subspecies of the same species. So it depends on the authority that you're using. Uh, but most people now consider green warbler to be a separate species. Um, it's quite subtle. Um, the green warbler is a, a rather more brightly coloured, both so that the green tends to be a brighter green, it's got more yellowish tones on the, um, uh, on the supercilium, more yellowish wash on the cheeks and so on. Um, and the call is, it's, it's similar, there's a subtle difference. Um, so it, they're not easy to separate. Um, but the green warbler, as its name suggests, the green warbler just, just more strongly uh, toned plumage than the greenish warbler. Greenish warblers can look quite, quite dull. I mean, sometimes greenish warblers, if it, they don't have wing bars, can, can look almost a bit like a chiff chaff. Um, the Humes warbler, the key difference between both green warbler and, and, and greenish warbler and the Humes is take a look at the wings. Take a look at the wings. And if I quickly go up to the, um, uh, just, just find the picture of, um, just find the picture of Humes, you'll see what I mean. Um, just give me it's, here we are um, so here we have the humes and you remember I said look at this part of the wing the, the tertials what's very distinctive on the humes leaf warbler which you will not see on greenish warbler or green warbler is these very patterned tertial feathers. So these are the flight feathers on the inner part of the wing. They're folded like that when the bird is perched, one on top of the other. And they have uh, these dark centers and pale edges. A very striking feature um, that Hume's leaf warbler will show, uh, which you won't see with the uh, greenish and the green. Okay. Great, and just one last question. Okay. The others have, I think, all been answered in your presentation. This is. Okay. Uh, is there any difference in the lower mandibles of the two chiff chaffs? Of the two chiff chaffs? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's let's bring up those pictures. Um, they are. Here we are. Look. Now you'll see. This particular photograph of mountain chiff chaff clearly shows slightly paler on the lower mandible, doesn't it? Um, and this picture of the common chiff chaff uh, shows the mandible, both mandibles being a bit darker. Now, sometimes the lower mandible on a, on a common chiff chaff can look slightly paler than the upper mandible. Um, but uh, I think it's a question of, yeah, just having a good look at some photographs and seeing whether that's a consistent feature. It's not something which I um, would like just off the top of my head to, to make a pronouncement about, but certainly there does seem to be on that particular individual, um, a slightly paler, uh, lower, lower mandible and this rather very nice photograph uh, of, of Mountain Chiff Jaff. Um, so, it's something for people to look at. I mean, we're all learning and, you know, if people are, have the fortune once lockdown is finished to get up to Ladakh, uh, one of my favorite places in the world and uh, just try and get good looks at mountain chiff chaffs, get photographs of them. And, but common chiff chaffs, certainly there is some variation. I, I have seen common chiff chaffs with, with paler bases, to, certainly the base of the of the lower mandible. Okay. Thanks. Before we sign off, Martin, this last one thing is about tickles leaf warbler. Anything on that? Uh, well, 
let's um I don't have a picture to show of, of, of Tickle's leaf warbler, I'm a, sorry. Um, I, I would say, I mean, the key, the, the key com confusion there was, is with sulfur bellied, which is, of course is the, is the much commoner um, uh, bird, certainly in the Delhi, Delhi area. Uh, tickles is something to be aware of. Um, the, it tends to have a different behaviour. Um, you remember that the sulphur bellied is quite distinctive in you know, walking around like a, perching like a nuthatch, feeding like a nuthatch, uh, often on ground or on rocks. Tickles warbler does feed on the ground sometimes, but very often in, in trees and shrubs. So that behaviour is different. Um, it's often in, in, in flocks um, and yeah, I mean, the plumage wise, the differences are, are subtle, but I would say look at the library of photographs on oriental birds. Um, take a look at the description in um, Birds About Delhi and uh... Hello. I think the thunderstorm is back. Yeah, but all in good time, I think. It was a fantastic learning experience for all the warblers. And hopefully we will try and ID them more easily now. And tomorrow evening, we join, please join us again for a uh, Pipits for Dummies by Ramit Singhal at 5 p.m. So I think Martin is gone for the, again with the storm again. Thank you all. See you. Ciao.